Welcome to another episode of the Barbell Therapy Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Brett Scott, with my co-host, Dr. Connor Bambasi. Today, we are going to talk about five easy ways to manage and hopefully improve your sciatica symptoms uh, if you happen to be having something like that, or even a lot of these two go for low back pain. So uh, there, there's plenty to be said and plenty for any patients and, and trainers and coaches to learn too about some of the easiest first steps we do to manage someone with sciatica and it's really all not even that hard. So Connor, do you, uh, what are you being for Halloween this weekend? I am the main character from the be- the breakfast club with the jean jacket and the sweatpants and the grungy gloves and sweats. Nice. I have to be Luigi this weekend. And, uh, but I got my tiger Crocs on and I have a, I just realized I have my tiger mug for coffee. So I think I'm Tiger King today. I like it. Yeah. So anyways, um, improving sciatica, things we can do about it. Uh, first, we want to go through a little bit about what sciatica even is, because I think some people are confused about sciatica. Uh, since last week, I had two people tell me they had sciatica in their neck. So similar, but different. So um, what... What do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about of what the symptoms of sciatica are, Connor? So for symptoms of sciatica, the first thing that always jumps to everybody's head, I think, is they get zinging down their leg. But something that we got to clarify sometimes, that can present a lot of different ways. That can present as muscle weakness. It can present as tingling, numbness, discomfort down the leg. But a lot of times what we got to clarify is that it starts in the low back usually travels through the glute and then can go down as far as the like the toes depends on how far how severe it is yeah and the the thing we need to note with sciatica too is sciatica is a symptom it's not a condition right so there's various different ways one can acquire the symptoms of sciatica so typically it has something to do with the nerve uh, being impinged either by the disc or the bone around it, um, which can cause some symptoms. Now, this can happen from different things. It can happen from a not even mechanical issue, but just repeated flexion can create a sensitivity. So things like, you know, you're painting your house, you're doing a lot of gardening, or you did a lot of manual labor, or you deadlifted with a new stance Anything like that uh, with repeated flexion can potentially um, cause low back pain, some inflammation, which can always uh, make a nerve sensitive. But there's also other ways that this can happen too, which could uh, be resultant of things like uh, vertebral fractures. Um, You know, we, we have various pieces of that lumbar spine that can fracture that one vertebrae can slip on another, which is something we call spondylolisthesis. So when we're managing low back pain or yourself managing low back pain, we need to make sure we don't have some major red flags. Um, you know, if you've been seen by us, you get a pretty thorough evaluation. I will tell you right now, if, if you haven't been in, I am not your medical provider. So don't take everything we say here as a grain of salt. These are just some things you can start doing to probably help manage you a little better if you fit into kind of the common scenarios we typically see here, right? So one of the first things we want to touch on is um, how these things typically happen. So Connor, give us a good example of uh, you know a typical sciatica patient. What do we see? What did they do? Zing down the leg and they're always bending over. Yeah. So like you said, typically a sciatica patient will come in and they will have done something. And sometimes too, they'll just wake up in the morning. And so if you just wake up in the morning and you have pain, you know, running down your leg and this shooting, zinging, fiery pain uh, or numbness, tingling, anything like that, you got to think back to what you did the day before. Because if you, you know, were doing a bunch of, you know, forward bending, stooping, squatting, things like that, uh, and you feel fine, and then you wake up the next morning, it's likely from the the post-inflammatory effect of exercise or manual labor that can cause some of these things. So typically, what we see is sciatica result from these forward flexion activities, 
an overload that someone isn't used to. It's it's more training that they've never done before, or maybe their stress was extra high that day. And then we kind of just have this, and now we're in a significant amount of pain. So now, typically, everything that has to do with bending over hurts. So sitting for prolonged periods of time will hurt. Uh, bending over to put your shoes on, um, you know, to put your socks on, even you know, trying to put your pants on sometimes can really flare these symptoms up, and they're very hard to manage in the beginning if you don't know what is actually bothering it. So what we want to go through today is an understanding of what sciatica is, what things we're looking at, and what contexts we're looking at, and how we can just better manage those. Because at the end of the day, if someone is just banging themselves in the head repeatedly and we don't stop doing that, typically it's not going to get as as much better as it potentially could, right? So there's some things and behaviors we need to change. So first off, the three pillars we look at of what we call an orthopedic sensitivity, which is just regarding the spine and how we look at the nerve, the disc, and our symptoms there. So we have three components to this. So we have load, which is uh, any extra weight outside of the body. So this can just be gravity. So sitting all day um, or even standing all day is accumulated load on the spine. So that kind of axial loading or, you know, if I was just sitting here and there was a weight on my head, that's an axial load. If I lay down, we have zero load on the spine. Right? So load is a major component for many people of, typically people will see with sciatica of, yeah, it it's typically best in the morning. And then it can get worse later on in the day and kind of creeps up on them around that, you know, three o'clock mark or so maybe. The other piece we have is tension. So we have nerves that run all the way from our toe, like a cable, all the way up into our brain. So with that being said, if I am sitting in a slumped position with my leg all the way out in front of me and straight, and then I drop my head, right, I am fully tensioning that nerve. And this is similar to a position most people drive in. And this is a symptom uh, or a position that can exacerbate sciatica pretty easily. And it's pretty easy to manage too. So if you just think of, let's, let's look at your car seat, right? How are you driving? Is your seat all the way back? Are you sitting with the seat pan all the way up? So your knees are actually higher than your hips and your backs rounded out. That that's a position where if we get someone just seated up taller, you know, we get them sitting a little bit closer to their foot pedals. Things can be a lot easier to manage there. Uh, and the last thing we look at is position. So with this, uh, our typical, you know, 20 to 40 year old experiences sciatica, uh, our position of sensitivity is going to be flexion. Sometimes it can be, can be extension. Um, so again, forward flexion, bending down, touching your toes, things like that. Those all typically flare someone up or aggravate the symptoms, uh, of sciatica. Uh, if you're a gymnast, a dancer, a cheerleader, uh, weightlifters too, um, tend to be very extension dominant. So sometimes, you know, if back bending uh, into one of those, like, you know, bending back as far as you can patterns tends to irritate you more or cause uh, pain to radiate further down your leg. That's kind of a big red flag that we want to manage. And I would say seek medical attention because that might mean you could potentially have a fracture and uh, don't take anything we say here for uh, complete knowledge of how you should treat yourself. So this is going to be mainly for someone that has flexion sensitive low back pain, which is probably 90% of what we see. So we have those three different pillars of sensitivity, and we're going to talk a little bit about each of these and how they play into our day to day. So, um, Connor, you want to talk a little bit about that car setup? Yeah, I mean, the car setup, like you already said, had a lot to do with the tension and the positioning. So I was really lucky. In my third clinical experience, we worked with a lot of football players, collegiate and professional, and two of them were experiencing sciatica. 
And one of the first things we talked about was, oh, how much time are you spending in your car? How much time are you sitting, watching plays, stuff like that? And we talked a lot about the car rides and how he drives sometimes six hours on the weekend at a, at a clip and then six hours back on a Sunday. And I was like, all right, let's go check out your car. And first of all, beautiful car. Love the car. But ergonomically set up was trash for it. It was like bucket seats. And he was wondering why he was getting these shooting pains like four hours into his drive. So I had him sit in the car. And then I started adjusting his lumbar support, how much he was reclined back, things like that. Scooted him a tiny bit closer to the pedals. Essentially, like you were talking about before, putting that nerve on slack and then trying to make him a little more comfortable. And sure enough, the following weekend, I get a text message from my CI, of course, not me, about how, oh, so-and-so said they did their six-hour drive and it felt much better this time. What'd you change in their car? And I was like, jackpot. That's what I'm talking about. Big (laughs) success. Especially when you're the student and you're just like you looking like the underdog. You love to see those wins. Yeah. And I, I think the car setup is probably the easiest one for people to understand. And people just think, oh, well, um, it's going to hurt in my car because my back's hurt. But really, there, there's plenty we can do to manage that. Because if if we're feeling pain, we're just kind of picking at a scab repeatedly. So the longer we sit there, uh, we're not making things better necessarily, right? So um, there are those three pillars there. So again, if we look at how far away from the seat we are, that's the the easiest thing to go after to alleviate tension on the nerve, right? And we can bring bring them closer together. And then where is our load? Uh, we can't really change load in here because we have uh, we have to sit upright to drive. Unfortunately, maybe if you drive a Tesla, you can uh, recline back and take it easy a little bit. But typically, we have to have uh, have ourselves vertical. So we can't eliminate load here, but we can change position. So, like we said, there are basically three adjustments we can make to our seats to make it a little bit uh, better suited for someone. So if we continue to have pain with, with any type of forward bending activity and like sitting in a crappy chair tends to bother it, right? Get that lumbar support on, or even put some pillows behind your low back to kind of get you seated upright out of flexion and more extension. And typically people will find a lot of relief there as well as getting themselves to sit up higher and have that seat pan actually tilted down lower so that their hips sit somewhat higher than their knees. So these things can immediately take you out of two of the three concept contexts of, or two of the three pillars of what could be bothersome to you. And a lot of times too, what we'll see with this is people the next day will or, or, or people think they have a good day and the next day they're like, I don't know why I'm in so much pain. It's like, well, you were sitting in a trigger for six hours and that caught up to you, right? And it's these little ticks throughout the day that just accumulate and build up. And then we hit that threshold of what we can tolerate for pain and then we're over it. And then we're chasing it down the next day, right? So that's that's basically what we can do for the car setup. And that's probably the easiest thing because we don't really have to do a whole lot, right? It's not like we're throwing a bunch of exercises at you because before I even throw a bunch of exercises at you, if you're doing this all day and you're bashing your head, let's just stop bashing your head first and see if the headache goes away, right? Let's stop picking at the scab and see if it just starts to heal on its own because we're, we just stop picking at it. We don't always need all these fancy exercises or needles or anything like that to cure your back pain. Right. So quick caveat on the car thing. I think it also depends upon how long your limbs are, how tall you are. And then another little feature you can look at is if your car's steering wheel can project towards you a little bit more. So you're not reaching or lunging forward at it. Yeah. That's another uh, big piece too, that we play with sometimes is definitely getting that steering wheel to go forward. Uh, But again, another easy fix next, the desk. So uh, we've probably seen more sciatica injuries this year than any other time. So between neck and low back, uh, people working from home, it took some people like over a year to finally uh, realize they're going to be working from home for a while and that they should probably invest in their own ergonomic setup. So our desk setup is another really important piece to managing uh, our load. So one of the biggest things we see of uh, I'm not going to call it a predictor, but um, 
what can slow down our process sometimes since we have patients and we'll have patients bring their pictures in too, right? I'm like, get, have someone at your place of work, get a picture of you, you know, kind of candidly at your workstation. So we can see how your environment fits and shapes you. So people will bring these in and typically uh, their chair doesn't fit them or support them that well, or they're just in a poor position or even their computer is in a poor spot. So the big things we look at with desk setup is, you know, first, how do you fit in your chair? Does your fair, does your chair fit you? So we had a patient yesterday, actually, that was, she was fairly petite and um, she had a chair that had the support only came up to like barely, I don't even think it got to her shoulder blades and she couldn't even use the back support. And like the seat pan was so long that she was basically just sitting in the slump position for hours and hours and hours. We're like, maybe this is what actually caused her back pain because she's she's had back pain since 2019 when she started working at the place and started sitting in that chair. So it just it 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 makes me wonder, right? And then so finding a chair that you can actually uh, sit in that actually you can feel your low back being supported by, so those muscles aren't just constantly holding us up all day. Because they get tired and they get irritated. So, and it, if, you know, in the meantime, if something happens and you have like this quick acute flare, take some pillows and throw them behind your low back. Simple as that. You can even go to like, you know, TJ Maxx, Marshalls, anywhere like that and get some, uh, get some, some low back support there. The other big thing is uh, where are your computer screens and where is your keyboard, right? So we want everything nice and close to us because... That way I don't have to reach much like the same as the steering wheel, right? So uh, if that computer monitor is really far away from me uh, and I keep kind of forward bending as I get involved with my work to look at it and look at it, I get closer and closer to that. And uh, that's more and more flexion and I'm not supported that whole time. So that's another big thing of bring your monitor closer and bring your keep your hands as close to the edge of the table as you can so that we're not reaching, we're not flexing. And that can make a huge difference in someone's um, low back pain as well as managing seat height. So the other piece there is uh, typically if, if we have a flexion sensitivity, we want someone sitting up as high as possible, right? And that way that kind of just – the the height of the hips determines the position of the spine. And so that way they're, they're, uh, they're much less in flexion and we will stop picking at that scab. Right. Um, and then the last one we, we really have is, and this is my favorite. And this is the one people don't know because they're relaxed. They, uh, it's the end of their day. There's no more work stress. We get home and where do we go sit? The Chase Lounge. Yeah, the Chase Lounge. So people don't realize it, but this is like the silent killer of sciatica, right? So whether you're sitting, you know, feet up on an ottoman or the Chase, this can be the thing that just is that ticking time bomb, right? And so this is where people will put their legs up. They're in a flexed position. Their legs are fully out and extended. That nerve is just fully on tension and we'll sit there for two hours at night and then we might start to feel it after a little bit. Maybe we won't, but then we're waking up in the morning and we have this back pain that we just can't chase down, right? Cut off the chase, right? Put your feet on the floor or lie sideways. Um, That's an easy way to unload your spine and give yourself more options there and uh, is probably the easiest thing we can eliminate. Although we all love, I love my chase lounge, but you know, can't have everything, especially if you're in a little back pain and you want it to get better. So that's another huge piece of eliminating load position and tension that the chase lounge kind of has all three components of what we need to eliminate to get your back pain better. Right. But again, you might be able to sit in that and not feel it right away. However, We have what's called that action potential threshold. So all these little signals are always being sent from our body parts, from our joints, our muscles, uh, the chemical levels in our blood of how much inflammatory marker is there, right? Those things keep sending feedback and those three components accumulated over a period of time 
will put us over that threshold and then we can't chase down our pain, right? So that is the biggest one that we can manage. A little point about the chase too. Something that makes it almost like more, not dangerous, but makes you more sensitive. Where are you looking? Like is your TV up high so that you can kind of recline back and look up at it? Or are you on your laptop hunching over or are you reading a book, a physical book? I know nobody reads those anymore. Or if you're on your iPad or your Kindle, are you hunched over leaning down? Because then that's literally the slump test for us, right? Yeah. Um, and that, that that's a good uh, leeway into when you get uh, sciatica of the neck from the laptop. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's plenty of things that just the laptop is one of the greatest inventions, but isn't uh, something that is always a benefit to us when we use it uh, out of moderation. Yeah, we love the laptops. But Brad, I have a question for you real quick, just to reel you back into desks. How do you feel about standing desks and people that have the option to use them? Uh, standing desks can be great. So I think that's another thing too for uh, anyone with back pain that's listening is kind of reflect with yourself of what hurts and what doesn't and start doing more of what doesn't hurt and less of what does hurt, right? So if you come in and you say, yeah, every time I get up in the morning and I go to put my shoes on and I'm standing up doing it or putting my socks on and that hurts, or I go to do laundry and and bending over it, that all hurts, okay? But standing, walking around is fine. You know, do you have a standing desk? Because if sitting hurts, if flexion hurts, and sitting and flexion kind of go together, right? Uh, sitting is typically a flexion-based activity. If those things hurt and, and standing doesn't, I'm going to say you're probably load sensitive. Extension is where we want to be more of. And extension uh, is where you should be with a standing desk, right? So the other thing too we need to keep in mind uh, with managing this, and this is one of the other pieces to uh, getting ourselves better. And one of the easiest things we can do is get up frequently, right? Variability is our friend with back pain and sciatica. So that being said, uh, if I sit in a flexion based position, right. And when I'm sitting, I don't really have any options. I'm sitting, I'm sedentary. My muscles aren't really firing. And this is when we start to create this like inflammatory soup that just brews. And that's why a lot of people will get up and they feel super stiff and like it takes them a minute to stand up straight, right? With a standing desk, not only do we have better worker productivity, but we have more variability, right? I can shift my weight around. I can move. My back extensors are actually working to hold me up. My core is working a little bit better. Now, not that we want to do that all day, but if we can split up our day 50-50 between a standing desk and uh, a, a seated desk, so something like what we recommend here is the Vera desk. Uh, those can be huge options for someone to um, promote variability and somewhat decreased, um, you know, a, a, we're staying out of that flexion trigger and we're just promoting more blood flow. And it's it's a much better option for most people like that. Now, if you were the other way, say you were a gymnast and you every time you bend backwards, you have extension-based pain. Well, maybe you have a different issue going on and this doesn't fit the mold for you. Maybe you should be sitting more than standing for now until we, until you find a medical provider to manage your care. Um, so those, those are the big things. That, and, and with that being said, one of the other things is, and this can become uh, symptomatic after a period of time, but short, brisk walks of like five to 10 minutes during the day, uh, getting up from your chair. You know, so if, if you notice you know, after 30 minutes of sitting, you start feeling pain, make sure you're getting up every 25. Don't wait for the pain to come in. Be proactive about getting up before you feel that pain set in so we don't go over that threshold. And and then our symptoms won't kick in. So we're kind of resetting the system every 15, 20 minutes uh, in acute bouts so that we don't get stiff. We don't have this inflammation just building up and uh, we can get all the much better that way. Connor, anything to add there? Uh, there, I would just say get outside, take your dog for a couple laps around the block. Because I know me, like if I stare at a computer for too long, I got to get outside and refocus my eyes. And then when I come back to my computer, I'm usually way more productive because my eyes have reset and they aren't as strained. 
Yeah, that's definitely um, a big piece there. And, and again, if it becomes symptomatic with, with walking, right? If you walk 15 minutes and you start to feel symptoms kind of flare up or your back tighten up, we'll only walk for, for you know, three minutes less than that. Uh, only walk find for the goldie minutes. Locks, right? Yeah, find the Goldilocks of something you can tolerate well uh, that's asymptomatic to a degree and stop before that. Uh, and, and frequency is big and, and continuing to go to work and everything too, because you're going to be up, you're going to be moving around more. Don't just sit on the couch, uh, laying in pain. Like they tell you to at the doctors. That's, that's been very well studied that, that, that is not what you should do when you have low back pain. Cause that can lead to a host of other issues too, uh, with our abilities or potential disabilities there. And then, uh, there's one more magic trick I have in my, my back pocket here. And that is if we have flexion based back pain, typically doing more extension uh, for a prolonged period of time will work. So uh, this is what some people will call the McKenzie prone press up, the Cobra stretch, um, repeated prone extensions or standing extensions. So uh, a lot of times what we find too is just people will have this lingering low back pain and they're just they're in too much flexion all day and they just, it's, it's a dosing thing, right? So too much flexion, not enough extension or full joint range of motion, and we can create symptoms there. So a lot of times getting you down on your belly, um, letting the back, the low back and the hips relax and, 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 you know, like the belly button kind of just relax and drop into the floor. And we just have patients typically start on their elbows, like a little kid kind of watching TV from the floor, right? Getting some tummy time. And, and sometimes people feel a little bit of back pain with this, but if we, we follow with it and we just breathe through it a little bit, as long as symptoms aren't getting worse or traveling down the spine, things can start to, you know, after a minute or so feel better. So we'll have patients hang out, uh, you know, in this extended base position for, three to five minutes or so. And then they start to notice, oh yeah, that pain's going away or that, you know, the pain that was running down my leg that was behind my knee is now just centralized into my hip. And, uh, it can make things a lot easier, um, for them to manage if we just start giving them more extension, uh, instead of being in flexion. Connor, stop taking videos. Were you paying attention? Can't stop. Can't stop. Got to do it for the social media. That's right. Uh, So anyways, um, now you caught me off track. Oh, well. So more extension, (laughs) less flexion, right? So it's it's a dosing thing. So we can look at it like a buffer of a plus one, minus one. So if you have to sit eight hours a day, well, then subtract that by doing more extension and... Hold on. Sorry, we had some technical difficulties there for a second. So as I was saying, dosing that so that we have more extension and less flexion. Uh, So especially too for people that have certain jobs uh, that require some manual labor uh, and and do require some type of flexion, right? (sighs) Dosing it with more extension. And that can be kind of our offset of buffering out extension. So Again, if we're sitting for eight hours or we're bending over doing manual labor for eight hours, if we can just get into that extended position for more time, um, that can be one of the, the best things we have. And so many people don't go there because it it hurts their low back at first to go there or they feel this like tension or like knuckly compression. Um, but as long as it's not worse than you typically feel and it's not radiating down your legs, that's the one thing we go after that can actually make sciatica a whole lot better. We see symptoms kind of come right back up the leg over the period of a week or so, depending on how well they dose it. And there's, uh, it's not that hard to do, right? You just lay on the floor. Brett, something too, you're going to laugh about this, but I feel like when we're cueing people through the extension and you're going to laugh at me because it's me, but cueing their breathing, because I feel like a lot of times when people first get into that prone extension position, they're really tense. They're squeezing their glutes. They can't relax and breathe into it. So cueing them deep nasal breaths and then into their diaphragm and letting it out their mouth. 
it almost forces them to kind of relax their glutes and then kind of own that position slowly easing into more extension as they exhale. Yeah, there, there can be a lot to that too. And like some people, and, and we do progress people to come and straight up on their arms in that position. But if you can't tolerate that, if you can't breathe in that position, uh, it's too much. So go down to your elbows and start there because that's better than fighting with with what's too much pain that you can't tolerate, right? A little bit is okay, but we don't want to completely overdo it uh, to the point, yeah, we can't breathe and things. So being able to do it and be relaxed so it's passive and that we can just get some joint loading and instead of this uh, just giant tension through our low back will be a lot better there. So would you prefer a longer duration hold with a little bit less intensity there just for clarification? Yeah, absolutely. Because we want to build tolerance to it, right? Um, we can sometimes make things worse if we do too much too soon, right? Just like with anything. So starting with less and being able to add in uh, is, is typically what we do. And so sometimes we try to progress patience and we'll always start on the elbows and if it feels good, you know, great. We'll, we'll we'll progress to straight arms and sometimes like, yeah, that that's too much. And you can tell they get really tense. It's like, okay, let's go back to the elbows. Maybe we'll prop a pillow under their elbows or something like that. But, um, those are kind of the, you know, those are my go-tos and, and they're pretty simple to do. So you can even look up repeated prone press up exercise. Uh, modern manual therapy has a ton of them. Uh, my mentor Urson there, he has so many videos on all the nuances of that. So I would highly recommend checking out his page there. Uh, modern manual therapy, uh, Dr. E is his name. And, um, you can learn just about everything there's to know about prone press ups and repeated extension to improve low back pain from him. He's the guru on that. And, um, there's, there's plenty to learn from him about managing that low back pain. So, um, yeah, those are, those are the big things. So again, reviewing and reflecting with yourself of where is your back pain coming from? What activities seem to make it worse? Let's try to modify those. You know, is it low back flexion that's bothering it? Yeah. Okay. Let's look at that car setup, change that up a little bit, change the desk setup, even sleeping too. That was the only one we didn't really touch on is, you know, and I say to patients all the time, and I'll take my finger in my joint. And if you just extend your your finger joint back, right, it gets all white and we see the blood leave. Well, if we're in a poor position for eight hours and I'm not getting any blood flow there, the joint and the nerve or the disc or whatever just can't recover, right? So getting us into a neutral position where we can get good blood flow just improves recovery so much. Um. And so that's the other thing. That's the only other piece is that sleep position of get yourself lying down. So if you're a side sleeper, lie down, take a picture of yourself. And if you see that your back's all curved, you know, down into the mattress or up off the mattress, right? Use some pillows, put some pillows under like your rib cage and your abdomen um, to kind of just neutralize your spine into a comfortable position. And you might notice a big difference when you wake up in the morning. So... That's all we really have to touch on there. And um, we're definitely going to do more podcasts on low back pain because we see so much of it and there's so much information to put out there about it. So uh, the next one I want to do is managing the deadlift and the squat Can't on, wait. on low back pain. So uh, thank you guys for listening. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, visit our website, barbelltherapyandperformance.com. Uh, my email is Brett, B-R-E-T-T, at barbelltherapyandperformance.com, or shoot us, shoot us a message on Instagram at barbell.therapy, or check out our new gym and training side of things too at Architect Fitness, A-R-K-I-T-E-C-T. -E uh, we're in Tingsboro, Mass, and Concord, New Hampshire. Thank you guys for listening, and hope to see you soon.